that whole negotiation, you know, that we all talked with you about to try to get to the information you need, first you have to, of course, know what it is you're looking for, have multiple ways to get at it. And I think we're too quick to say, here's the person who has the information, and if they say no, we're done, as opposed to realizing that there are all kinds of routes to get to the same place. And every time you're confronted with a no, instead of accepting the no, you find a different question to ask until you finally get somebody who will say yes and you start cracking open doors. I think when, when Diana goes through some of the more specific stuff on financial reporting and on data, she'll probably have some really good strategies for you on that. Any of you ever been on a first date? <laughs> right? Um, sometimes the, 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 well, I really do think of source reporter relationships as a dance. And um, they pick the music, but you have to be the one who leads the dance. And you're in it together, right? So you're constantly reading them and trying to figure out how you can stay with them. And, and the key, I think, is to be ethical about it, which means you're genuine in your purpose. So um, you're honest and upfront about what you're trying to get, and, and you're not exploiting people as long as they know what they're in for, and they're involved in that process. But yeah, it's a dance. It's a negotiation. Um, we have to find each other's mutual kind of purposes here and go for it. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, this is, I mean, I said this once to a group of people, and they got really kind of shocked, but... Um, I've told you a little bit about the AIDS story I did following the two men through death. And uh, it was a very sensitive story, very personal story. And at the time, everybody said, why were they willing to talk to you? And I just said flat out, we had what I called a mutual exploitation contract. Do you know what exploitation means? Exploitation means you use the other person, right? You exploit the situation. They wanted their story told because they wanted to affect how the way people saw this situation. And I wanted to tell the story. We used each other. But we used each other honestly and sincerely. And so some people hear that and they think it's kind of, you know, slimy. I have no problem with it. I have no problem with it. Slimy, um, kind of slimy. Slimy, um, kind of nasty, you know. Not nice. Dirty, dirty. Yeah, yeah, underhanded right? But we were all very honest about it. I hope all six of these steps in this process are starting, you're starting to see how they tie together. Um, just as putting a story together isn't one thing, every story lends itself to multiple story po possibilities and to different approaches. Um, so almost any story you go after can be turned into a mini beat where you say, what doorway does this story crack open into multiple stories? And we might think, well, we did that story and it's time to move on. But the truth is, the more you write about a subject in different ways, the more possibility you have to reach readers. Because even as everybody in this room is, we're all different in an interest, a different approach to a story. So Yvonne likes those straightforward analysis stories, right? He likes that hard news. Get those people out of here, right? Wasting my time. I like reading profiles. I like reading profiles. Um, I need an emotional center to a story to really start understanding it. Do you guys know what a box score is? Box score. Um, when they cover football here in the news, how do they report on the statistics of the game? Tables, okay, we call it a box score because it's in a little box and it includes the scores of the game quarter by quarter or period by period. And in, in the U.S., if you open up any newspaper to the sports section, you will see multiple pages of box scores, tables, right? My, uh, my other half, my partner, is a big sports fan. And on Sunday morning, he gets up and he spends an hour or two with those tables. And I keep looking at him going, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he says, I'm reading about the games. And I said, those are the back box scores. He said, no, these are the stories of the games. That's how he absorbs information. 
I need the narrative story. I need to know that this character did this at this moment because that's how I absorb information. So we can't assume everybody's going to access important information through one story one time. So the more you can find multiple ways to give people information, the more luck you have building some depth and traction of knowledge amongst the public. And you can be your own, you know, we talked about focus groups. You can be your own successful focus group. You know, you, you're building a community here this week. And pay attention to how different each of you are. The public is the exact same way. One person wants it this way, one person wants it that way. Um, I remember years ago, because we're going to talk about structure and about different approaches to organizing material this morning, which is one of the hardest things for journalists. Um, uh, Bonner, would you agree? Structuring information once you get it? Yeah, it's really hard. Uh, and it, even top-notch journalists, I think it's thank God, frankly, that it's as hard as it is because it's why I have a job. <laughs> because I get to help people do it when they don't know how to do it themselves. But it isn't like you get to a point where you're now a senior writer, senior reporter, and suddenly it gets easy. It remains a struggle throughout your career. So again, having some tools and techniques helps. It also helps to remember that different people read different ways. And I remember years ago when the war in Bosnia, the war in Yugoslavia, Serbia, thank you. One of those mini wars was going on, right? And we we're writing about it and writing about it and writing about it. It was in the paper every day and I just didn't get it because it was so complicated, right? You got the Croats, and you got the Serbians, you got this going on, you got that going on. You got all these countries being divided. You've got different religious sects. I, couldn't, I just couldn't follow it. And I couldn't follow what it was doing to history and civilization and all this stuff. Then one day I woke up on a Sunday and I got my New York Times. Thank God for the New York Times. And I picked up the New York Times Sunday magazine. And they did this really interesting thing, and when I looked at it, I realized it was a structure solution to a complex situation. And they had a double truck. You know what a double truck is? Two pages opened up, right? We call it a double truck. So when you open up a book or a magazine and you see both pages next to each other, we call that a double truck. They had a double truck, and it was a black and white aerial photo of about two or three blocks of Sarajevo. So taken from the air, and all you saw was this street, and then buildings, pieces of rubble, right? So it was just a picture of part of a street. And then these were all numbered. There was a little piece of guff or chatter, text, copy up here, saying, you know, the war has gone on this, this long, blah, 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 blah. Sarajevo, one of the historically most beautiful cities in the world, which has long been a combination of this culture and this culture and this culture, you know, a place where different worlds come together, has been bombed, you know, X amount of times over the years. Here's the story of one street. And then down here there was a key. You know what a key is, right? Thing on the map that refers to this. And what they did was they went in and wherever they could, they found out what used to be in this building, business, a house, a family, what happened to that building, bombed on such and such a date, and anything they knew about the people who used to work or live there. And they wrote it in a simple sentence here. And then they went to this building and they wrote it in some, and they went down this block and they told the story of the destruction of Sarajevo and a thousand years of history in this simple, simple structure. It's a very, very smart thing to do. And I finally got the war. Interesting, huh? Structural solution to a complex problem. I'll tell you one other story, then we're going to look at some structures. 
um, it's really interesting to work with students because they struggle with everything, right? And um, you learn a lot because you have to kind of respond to their struggles. A student came to me, and my students go from doing little short news stories to big, big, complex pieces. A young woman came to me, and she wanted to do a story, a project, about eating disorders among college co-eds, college, young college women. Anorexia. You know what anorexia is, right? Trouble is that story's been done about 100,000 times. And so I don't like to say no to young journalists who, are, who have good ideas. I try to encourage them. But I didn't think this story would work. So I decided instead of saying no, I was going to set the requirements for the story so high that she wouldn't be able to do it. So I said, okay, I'll support that story, but here's what you have to do. In the next two weeks, you have to find a student here, a young woman here, who has some form of eating disorder, a severe one, who's really struggled. You have to get her to agree to go on the record with her name. You have to get her family to agree to talk to you on the record. You have to get her friends, her boyfriend, to agree to talk to you on the record. You have to get her doctor to agree to talk to you and give you her medical records. You have to get her psychologist, if she has one, to agree to talk to you. So you have to get her to get a waiver to her psychologist, her shrink. If she's been in the hospital, you need to get her hospital records. She needs to be willing to give us pictures of herself throughout her life. And oh, by the way, if she keeps a journal, you have to get it from her. I figured she'd go ask. She'd learn a few things about sourcing and about how hard it is to get people to talk. And then I'd get to say, you know, it was a great idea, but let's find another one. She came back in two weeks and she said, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> she had it all, right? She had it all. I was like, shit. Because <laughs> now we have to do this story, right? So... Um, so she goes out and we go through the reporting and she gets am amazing information. She had the doctor, she had the shrink, she had the hospital records. She's trying to put the story together. It's very complex. She's got medical information. She's got scientific background. She's got the personal story from the young woman. She's got the personal story from the family. Um, just incredible stuff. What do you do with that? Where do you begin to organize that information? So she did what a lot of writers do. She just sort of sat down and it kind of, boom, got all dumped. And she came back with maybe eight to 10,000 words of a mess. It's like, ugh, what do we do with that? So we stopped and I said, we need to have a structure for this. So we did. We tried to do a little bit of what I showed you yesterday with a lead and a nut graph. Where are we here? I'm going to be writing over a few things, obviously. <laughs> so we tried to do a few things where we say, well, let's start with a little scene, and then let's open it up, you know, to a traditional summary nut that, I um, can't remember what the young woman's name is, but Jessica. Jessica is one of, you know, 100,000 young women in the United States who suffer from severe eating disorders, blah, blah, blah. The condition is, you know, kind of a traditional nut graph and then go back into her story and maybe tell it chronologically. I don't know, you know, she was 12 when, and worked a little better, but she couldn't figure out where to put the medical stuff. It kept getting in the way. And then she said, well, what if we put that over here in a sidebar? You know what a sidebar is? Yeah. And that didn't really work, and the story was still long. So I said, okay, that was fine. Now let's, let's go back one more time, and we'll still have a scene and a summary nut, and then let's divide the story into topical chapters. So one chapter will be about the medical aspects of eating disorders. One will be about the young girl's history. One will be about, you know, how they treated her. That wasn't working because it was way too confusing. But she wrote that and it worked a little better. Then she went back and she did another thing. And, and it kept getting better, but it was still messy. And then I was reading through about a fourth draft. And one of the lessons here is if you really want to learn this stuff, you've got to keep doing it. Any of you play music? Any of you musicians? No? Any of you athletes? What sport? 
wrestling. And I'll bet when you started to wrestle, you just went right out on the mat and you instantly were good, right? No, you practice all the time. And you practice drills and you practice... When you play music, you start by playing the scales, right? And then you play little songs and then you play them over and over and then a slightly bigger song and you play that over and over. Journalism is like that. You have to keep practicing and keep going back at it and you make mistakes and you come back. So I'm reading through one of her drafts and she's getting kind of frustrated and I'm thinking, well, maybe it's good enough, but I realize we have one piece of missing information. And she said, what? what? You know, she's got everything. And I said, I know this is really sensitive for people, but um, do you happen to know what her weight was? How much she weighed along the way? And she goes, oh, you want her weight chart? Yeah, I got that. Was that important? And she pulls out the young woman's weight chart. And I look at it and I went, oh, oh. We needed a structural solution to a story. So I said, what if you take her weight chart and you take all of the information you have and you start the story at 117 pounds and you write a scene about what was going on at 117 pounds, which was when this young woman started to sort of lose weight. And then you open it up and you have your summary nut, and then you go back into your story, and your next section starts 112 pounds. And you write what was going on at 112 pounds. And then your next section is 98 pounds. And you write what was happening to her at that part of her life and what medical issues were starting to get involved, and who in her life. And then you go through, and now she's at 83 pounds. And you write that until you get me to 77 pounds in the hospital, almost dead. And then you come back, and she starts gaining weight, but then she drops again. And then finally the story ends at 114 pounds. What if you structure the story that way? All of a sudden, everything came together because this was, this was something that kept the story tied together. It was appropriate to the information, and it gave the, the writer an organizing principle. So anything you can do when you're gathering a bunch of complicated information to help you figure out how to organize it for yourself as a writer and for the reader so the information makes maximum sense and the most important information stands out. And that's one of the things that gets lost in a lot of stories. We as writers know what all the information is because we've gathered it. And we know why all the information matters and we know how it all fits together. The reader knows none of that. So we have to find ways to, it, to highlight the most important information, to let it have its own place in a story so it doesn't get lost, and then to move the reader quickly through to the next most important thing so they're not trying to figure out what am I supposed to be following here. Keep in mind that when you report, especially fast on deadline, all the information is shouting for your attention. You've got all your sources in your head, and they're all demanding their own attention and space. And one of the things that I think is just absolutely universal among reporters and writers, especially when they're working fast and don't have a lot of time, is that when they sit down to write, everything rises to the surface and becomes sort of equal again. And what you have to do when you're figuring out what to write is you've got to let the unimportant stuff sort of slip away and become background, and you've got to highlight the stuff you really need to use. And outlines help you do that. For some reason, most journalists seem to have a, an absolute aversion to outlining. And I don't know if it was because we were all traumatized by our sixth grade, you know, literature teacher, our composition teacher, or what. But most journalists just sort of sit down and start bashing at the keyboard. Maybe it's because we, we're working so fast we think we don't have time to stop and do that. In the same way we were kind of wrestling the other day with... How do you have time to sit down and come up with these ideas or with sources on deadline? Well, if you don't do that, you've lost time because you're going to get to the wrong people. So one way is to lay out your facts. 
And I love the fact that you're going to highlight your key facts and then you're going to list the comments that are related to those facts. Sure, it can change, but he's pushed himself the next level. Diana mentions chronology. Very smart thing to do. People uh, live their lives chronologically. One thing happens to us, then the next, then the next. And therefore, chronology is the easiest way human beings can understand meaning and events. We talked yesterday about the inverted pyramid is hostile to chronology because it's, you know, it's in reverse order. But she also, you noticed, indicated that um, that means sometimes she leaves her lead, the top of her story, until the end. It's very hard for some reporters to do. I was a writer who, unless I had my lead written, I couldn't write the rest of the story. Which means sometimes I spent 90% of the time that I had to write a story on the lead, and I left very little time to write the rest of it. Which means if you look at the work I did when I was younger, the tops of my stories were really, really good, and the rest of my stories sucked. And I mean, they sucked. They were too long, they wandered all over, they had no organizing principle, and my endings really sucked until I learned how to get past that. Chronology is an interesting thing to do because it not only helps you organize your information, but it helps you know if you have all the right information. Because if you have to lay out in order what happened, you might see, oh dear, I'm missing a whole part of this story. So it forces you to actually report and know the chronology. Very smart thing to do. I'm going to show you a structure in a minute about this. So you're listing out the key points that you need to make in this story and how you're going to back those up, right? What information do you have that supports those key points? This is what I finally learned how to do. Causes and consequences. It's another way to start organizing your material. I have a friend who used to do a lot of profiles. She was just a loved, she loved uh, personality stories and she loved to interview, but even when she was a police reporter, she used to go through her notebook and she would pull out all her best quotes. And she'd type them out because what she wanted was the voices in the story and the quotes were either sparkling personality if she was doing profiles or they were the quotes that got to the heart of the information or the controversy that she was reporting at, about, right? Um, if it was a police story, the quotes were either the police talking about some incident or a victim who had something to say or a lawyer who was getting involved in a case. So she would pull out her quotes, she would list her sources so she kind of knew, right, that she had covered the... the playing field, and then she would figure out how she was going to build her information so those quotes got highlighted. So she would literally organize a story around her interviews and her quotes. Would have driven me crazy, but boy, it worked for her. The key here is that you don't have to do, structure is a tough thing to talk about because everybody thinks, you know, this is the, this is the, this is the way to do it. You can do structure and approach structure any number of ways, but have a way. Figure out what works for you. Let's say you're writing about, uh, in the U.S., what, a couple years ago this happened when we, it was announced that Toyota, um, Toyota was recalling a bunch of cars, right? Did you, do, you, do you, people drive Toyotas here a lot? Is that a big car in this market? Huge deal when Toyota announced a recall because Toyota was the car company that built its reputation on quality control. And Toyota was the company that all the other companies in the world tried to emulate because of their quality control approach. So Toyota recalls a bunch of cars. Huge story. Well, remember what we were saying about the source and story wheel? If you put people on the source and stakeholder and story wheel for that, you'd have dozens of them. Well, where do you start? which part of the story is more interesting and more important. One thing to think about doing is say, the lead, Toyota recalls a bunch of cars, your summary nut, tell me how many cars, first time in history, raises questions about Toyota's quality control, future of the company, and leaves several consumers like screwed up because they're driving crappy cars, right? Got a guy from Toyota saying, no, 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 we're gonna fix this, it's okay. 
You got a guy from General Motors saying, neener, neener, go buy a, you know, go buy a Chevy. And then what if your story is organized literally along that stakeholder wheel or key topics? The impact on Toyota's sales, you know, what, what Wall Street says or what the sales say. Consumer information, what do you do with your car? Uh, the quality control question, what went wrong? What the other car dealers are saying? So you take the key points that you're going to build that story into and you literally break them out, put a strong subhead on them. That way people can go through your story and they can go from part to part that they want to read about most and you haven't forced them to kind of work their way through a story. So you're actually organizing, aggressively organizing this story for the reader as well as yourself. And on the web, you can build these so each of these terms is searchable. So people can literally go in and they can pop to the part of the story they want. Is this making sense? What this forces you to do is to make that list of the key aspects of the story. And then the easiest thing in the world to do is to write to that list. It is a form of doing um, the um, box score. And what did you call it? The tables. What we're doing now, this is about a construction project is summarizing the project in the top in one paragraph. Here's what it's about. Here's the background. And then literally, you'll see people going through and highlighting where things are going to happen, right? So the reader doesn't have to um, mess with it. And then we're labeling out, here are the comments. Here are the opinions. Here's what this person has to say. Here's what's next. You're labeling and tearing apart a story and helping a reader get through it easily. We try to make too many of our stories into kind of tightly knit yarns, and the information gets lost. And so if what you want is the information to stand out, let it stand out. Make a list, make bullet points, make subheads, and write to those. It's also faster to do, because once you make that list, then you're just writing to the list. You know where your quotes go, you know where your facts go, you know where your stats go, you know where your background information goes. It's the same way as writing to that weight scale of that young woman. Once, um, once the reporter knew that she needed to write to 111 pounds, she had everything she had at 111 pounds, and then she moved on. Holding people who have financial power accountable the impact they have on the rest of us is the essence of strong financial coverage. And you can do that by asking, what are the consequences of putting that shopping center there rather than there? What are the consequences of the kinds of video games that are being sold? That's a business. So we, we hold those with financial power accountable, <coughs> and we also educate our readers to make financial decisions. You know, when you cover politics and government, in part, you're trying to educate them for that day once or twice a year when they get to vote, right? You want them to be informed about the political issues. Same here. You want them to be able to make informed decisions. And what are they making decisions about? Well, things that are going to determine whether they have any retirement savings, things that are going to determine whether they take on more debt to buy a house than they can afford, things that help them determine how to pay for a college education, whether that makes sense to borrow money or not. These are the things that will destroy or enhance their lives, their individual lives. So a nation is the sum of its people. If its people aren't making good financial and business decisions, the whole nation is going to feel the effect of that. So our job has never been more important. And I say that uh, not just here, where business is stretching its muscles and, and testing its power in, an, in a newly democratized or a newly capitalistic uh, economy, but in every economy. Business can defeat all of its natural predators. Who are they? Government. That's the traditional predator of business, right? It, it regulates them. It monitors them. It, uh, it arrests their CEO. I mean, 
government can be a big balancing, when I say predator, I mean predator as in the sense of ecological balance out in the environment. You know what happens if you've got a little animal like a ferret, a little ferret that loves to eat people's gardens, but ferrets, if they're out in the wild, don't get wildly out of control. Why? Because you've got eagles and owls that like to eat little baby ferrets. So it keeps the population under control. They balance each other. There's a check and a balance. Same thing here. Government can be a check, a balance on the power of business. Unions, workers can be a check on the power of business. What does this world of business consist of? And how do we start exploring it? My thesis for you today, when you think about the world of business, what, you've got 220 companies listed on your local stock exchange. <clears throat> you've got a bunch of other companies that aren't on your local stock exchange. You've got little small businesses that are mom and pop stores and mom and pop shapes. You look at the world of business and you say, oh my God, it's got a million moving parts. You know, it's like a, a, a tray full of BBs that are just, you know, little rolling things rolling all over and you're trying to keep it all straight. It all comes down to three, let me see if I can advance this thing next. Um, Oops. It comes down to three primary foundations. Virtually all business coverage I have ever done, and I've been a journalist for 44 years, falls into one of these categories, or some combination of the two. So, markets. What, what do I mean when I say all kinds of markets? Well, you know the obvious markets. What are they? Now, what do you mean a consumer market? Okay. Gro well, I'm not talking grocery stores. I'm talking markets. So, yes, there is a commodity market where wheat trades. There is a commodity market where cotton trades and gets made, purchased by people who make clothing. There are markets where bonds trade. There are markets, which I just recently encountered, where foreign currency trades. That's a market. How much is my dollar worth compar compared to your currency? The market makes that decision. Not some guru up on high. It's a function of supply and demand, right? <laughs> Maybe not in your country. Currency, currency markets can be different. But bond markets, stock markets, what makes a stock go up? Nope, nope. What makes a stock go up? In the absence of that, in the absence of news, what makes a stock go up? Nope. The demand for the stock exceeds the supply. What happens when there's more demand than supply? The price goes up. More people want to buy Apple stock than, at, at, uh, than there is available Apple stock. And so at, when Apple is trading at $150 a share, people are still eager to buy it. So what happens? Somebody says, I'll give you $151 a share. And somebody tells you, she says, no, 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 $155. And you say, no, okay, $157. So what have we got? What do we call that? An auction. It's an auction. Most markets are auctions. How much will you pay me for my bushel of wheat? Oh, no, she's going to pay me more for my bushel. You want to raise your price? She's going to get my bushel of wheat. That's how it works. Markets. Most markets are auction markets. As you point out, the currency market might be a slightly different sort of market. But, but typically, the currency markets operating worldwide, which are one of the biggest markets in the world, the foreign currency markets, supply and demand. More people wanted some yen today than wanted dollars for some reason. Um, so you know, the, the, yen, the value of the yen vis-a-vis -vis the dollar went up. So all a market is, is an arena 
where supply and demand set a price. That's where supply meets demand to determine a price. The fancy thing that, that business school professors say is, it's a price discovery mechanism. <laughs> it is. It's a way of determining a price. Let's say, for example, real life example, back in the 90s, a company called Drexel Burnham um, did a big business in the United States selling what we called, although they didn't like it, junk bonds. They were bonds that were issued by somewhat shaky companies. And because their credit wasn't very good, they, they paid very high rates of interest. And people were eager to earn high rates of interest on their money. So lots of people bought junk bonds. Well, the truth was, it was not an honest market. It was a rigged market. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It was a market where Drexel would tell you what it would buy your junk bond for and what it would sell it to you for. So it didn't matter whether, <laughs> whether you were happy with the price or not, and it doesn't matter whether you wanted to pay that much or not, that's what it cost because Drexel was running that market. Okay, fast forward Drexel. Uh, Drexel's key junk bond creator, Michael Milken, gets arrested, imprisoned, the game is over. The jig is up. The rig is, is undone, right? What happened? We've got, I mean, you've got junk bonds. You've got junk bonds. All of you have junk bonds in your bank account, in your desk drawer that you bought when you had a real market. All of a sudden, there's no market. What do you do? How do you discover what those bonds are worth if they're worth anything, I mean, do you just paper the bathroom with them? I mean, what do you do with your junk bonds when the guy that was telling you what they were worth is on his way to prison? How do you do that? You try to sell them. You do just what we just did with my bushel of wheat, don't you? Now, in a broken market where nobody's ever actually had to be a buyer and seller where supply and demand has never been tested before. Didn't matter what the supply was, she had to pay whatever the price was. All of a sudden, this market has to learn all these things. So one of the first things you're probably gonna do is take inventory. Well, how many bonds are there from company X? Oh my gosh, what do you mean there's a million of them? I thought there was only half a million of them. So does, we take inventory to determine what the supply is. And then somebody says, well, I'd like to sell some of my company X bonds. Everybody now knows there's a million of these bonds out there. Will anybody offer me anything for them? Well, nobody answers, right? Nobody wants to give any answer. However, Andre over here has gone into the books of that little company that issued those junk bonds, and he realizes, you know, they've got a patent on a neat little gizmo that I bet is going to be really useful in the cell phone industry. It hasn't been developed yet, but they've got the patent. They don't have the money to develop it. Those bonds, those bonds can be converted into shares of stock in the company, I could wind up owning the patent on that neat little gizmo if I can buy up enough of these bonds. So he's got some information that the rest of us, because we haven't done our homework, don't have. Okay, so Tara says, okay, I've got some of these bonds. I don't want them. I have no idea what they're worth. So you say, you go say to Andrew, Andrea, you said, ah, I got some of these. Bargain. What are you asking? He says, what do you want? He's not going to tip his hand, right? So what would you be, you know, you'd take a stab? So, 90, so 10 cents on the dollar for these bonds, a bond that's supposedly worth $100 at par, you can get it for 10 bucks. How's that sound to you?
No, he's not interested at 10 bucks. Oh, he now he wants to buy yours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you you're, you're going to sell even though he he doesn't have any information. He's just bluffing. You know that these bonds could really be valuable. You're not bluffing. Why aren't you bidding more? Ah, you're nervous about buying those. Form a consortium, all four of you around the corner. Oh, okay. Okay, you you own these th these bonds are out there and if you can control enough of these bonds, you can buy this company. And the company has a little treasure inside it that nobody else knows about. It might be a patent, it might be a piece of real estate that they own, it might be the right to do business with a certain big company. It's got something valuable that isn't widely known. And you decide you want to take over that company through its bonds. You want to buy that company through its bonds. So what you're going to do is quietly talk to Taras. You're going to talk to Andre, maybe. You're gonna, Svetlana's going to say, well, I've got some. I got some of those bonds. I don't want them. Uh, but, but Svetlana's learned something about some of the bonds you own. She's learned that that particular company was founded by a designer whose work has just started to become really fashionable in some trendy neighborhoods in Tokyo that set all kinds of fashion trends. So she knows that about bonds that you've got. You know something secret about bonds the rest of us has. What will happen, to fast forward here, a market will develop where everybody thinks that their bond is worth something, but they're not sure what. And the way they're going to find out what it's worth is offer it to somebody. Put it out there. Actually, what you're probably going to do, because you're so frustrated at trying to do it phone call by phone call, you're going to say, why don't we all get together down at the bar and we'll you know, we'll do some trading. We'll do, we'll just do some trading. I mean, he wants to buy your bonds, you want to buy her bonds. We'll all just see what we've got and start trading back and forth. And before you know it, you've got the New York Stock Exchange. That's how it was born in a coffee house in the 1700s in New York. Bunch of guys who liked to trade stocks, but it was, you know, it, you just happen to be there when they, when they pass. The guy you're trying to buy the stock from doesn't show up for three days. What are you supposed to do? Just hang around that street corner waiting for him to show up? So they started meeting in a coffee house in downtown Manhattan, and it slowly became the place you went <coughs> if you wanted to trade stock because you knew all the other people who had stock to trade would be there, and you could start discovering what your bonds were worth and start trading them. And before you know it, a piece of paper, a bond, that you thought was worth nothing when Drexel's guy went to jail, all of a sudden you've got a way to figure out what it's worth. And that's what a market is. It's a way to discover what something's worth. There's another feature of a market that's, credi that's credibly important. It's a place with enforceable rules. The New York Stock Exchange meeting in that coffee house wouldn't have lasted very long if the people who showed up there promised to sell you 100 shares of this railroad stock, took your money, and left town without ever giving you the stock, right? You're not going to go back and, and do business there anymore, are you? So the other players who wanted to make sure that people would come to the coffee house and trade said, look, we've got to have some rules here. We've got, we, first of all, you can't come here and trade stocks unless you notify us who your banker is and get a letter of reference so that we know you actually have some money to pay for these stocks. And if you default on a deal, if you do that and leave town, you're never going to trade stocks in this town again. We're going to ban you from the market. Basic rules, simple rules. All markets have rules. Your stock market has rules. 
They're not always enforced. I can tell you from what I've learned, there are rules that say you've got to disclose certain kinds of information. Not every company does, or they do it a year late, two years late. But there are rules, and they can be enforced. What's the exception to that, to markets being a place with rules? Mm -hmm. Force majeure is one, where, people, where government could just step in and say, I don't care what the market says your land is worth, I'm taking it. Another one, do you have a black market in Ukraine? Sure you do. Any rules in a black market? Well, informal ones. But, but they're not, where would I go to look up the rules for your black market? Yes, okay. But if I want to go look up the rules for your black market, market where am I going to find them? They'll tell you what the rules, right, they'll tell you what the rules are, but I got to learn it on my own. So even a black market has rules, but who enforces them? The market itself. I break those rules, I might get my kneecaps broken, right? So every market has rules and they're enforceable. But markets are not perfect places. Things can go wrong in markets. I say markets are placed out to find out where some, what something's worth. But sometimes markets reach the wrong conclusions about some, what something's worth. That can happen when there are bottlenecks in supply. We talk about supply and demand. Let's say uh, you want to sell iPhones. A lot of people want to sell iPhones. And the ship bringing your crates of iPhones hits a storm, and I know it breaks all our hearts. It goes down with all your iPhones. So all of a sudden, the amount of supply that you thought you were going to have to sell iPhones has been disrupted by some act of God, some accident, some bottleneck that prevents supply from reaching the market. What's going to happen to the price? It goes up. It absolutely does. But then all of a sudden, somebody discovers, oh, there's a warehouse right across the border full of iPhones. The guy that was going to sell them went bankrupt. The bank seized them. They're in foreclosure. I could get those. You run over and buy them from the warehouse, and you bring them back. All of a sudden, there's more iPhones in Ukraine than even Ukraine can buy. So what happens to the price? goes down. Or let's say that all of us conspire together to corner the market on iPhones. What do I mean by cornering the market? We are going to own so much of those little things that we get to set the price, right? All together, we're going to slip around, you're going to go to one store, you're going to go to a couple of warehouses. We're all going to make quiet little deals to buy iPhones until we own 80% of the iPhones in Ukraine. If somebody wants an iPhone, what are we going to do? Well, here's what you got to pay for an iPhone. And they'll say, I'm not going to pay that. Of course, people almost never say that to Apple, but they say, I'm not going to pay that. I'll go look somewhere else. You say, fine, go look somewhere else. You won't find it. You won't find it at a better price because we own them all. That's called a corner on a market. And a corner on the market can produce price distortions. Did that iPhone get one bit better because we all bought them up and tucked them in our warehouse? Did the iPhone get one bit better because of ocean line, a, a freighter full of them went down to the sea? No. But the price went up when those things happened. So it was, it was a way of discovering what the iPhone was worth, but it is a price that was affected by extraneous event, events. You can affect supply, and that you can artificially affect supply, like we did when we snuck around and bought all the iPhones, and affect the price. Here's another thing we can do to affect the price artificially. We can tell everybody that using an iPhone uh, makes you sterile. We've, we've got a couple of fake scientists whom we find 
who do a couple of reports that we put up on a blog and a web post. Oh, yes, there's plenty of studies. They're coming out of Europe. They're coming out of Latin America showing that high use of iPhones is highly correlated to people not being able to have children. So what are we trying to do with that little number? We're affecting demand. Right, we're depressing demand. All of a sudden, nobody wants to buy an iPhone, right? Unless it's as a new method of birth control, right? But nobody wants to buy an iPhone. So by telling this story, we have affected demand. And what's then going to happen to the price of the iPhone? It goes down. See how easy this is? But it, the point is that things that can drive prices up may be real, it may be a real shortage of iPhones because a shipment that was supposed to come sank. Or they may be fake. It may be uh, that suddenly demand for iPhones has dropped because someone's telling a lie about iPhones. So as you look at prices in markets, be aware that in the best conditions, they're set by supply and demand. But both of those factors can be manipulated. And so if a, if a stock has gone from 100 to 400 in a month, you might want to ask, is that, has demand for that stock really quadrupled in a month? Has supply of that stock been cut down to a quarter of what it used to be? Or is this a rig? Has somebody bought up all the iPhones? So... There's another thing that markets tell us that it's critical that you know for your readers. Markets basically tell us the price of risk. The price of risk. Let's say I want to borrow money to start a business. And I go to my friendly banker and I say, Ivan, I've got this great business plan. Um, I'm, go I've, I'm going to make a little device that'll, that hangs around your neck and allows you to attach it to your iPhone so that if you're using it as a camera and then you need to just put it down, just like a camera strap, only it's an iPhone strap. And I want to manufacture those. Um, I hope to get a license for Apple to sell them through the Apple store, but I don't have that yet. Um, I actually don't know anybody at Apple at all. Uh, it's going to require some manufacturing. I do have a friend who might have some manufacturing space. Uh, I, I need to borrow a million dollars for this. <laughs> so, what do you think? Uh, well, I think you should first discover risks and build some business plan if it's working. Yeah. Because then you bring this all over. Okay, so I've done a nifty little business plan. I bring it back to you. You decide, all right, I'm going to give you the loan. But do I just have to pay you back a million dollars? No. What do I have to pay you? <laughs> oh, I have to pay you back one and a half million dollars for the million dollars I loan. I can't do the math, but someone who can can calculate what that interest rate would be. You're going to charge me an annual interest rate because you're not going to wait for the end of this game to get paid, right? You want me to be paying you along the way so you're making a little bit of money? 50% interest. Every year. Okay. Bill Gates comes to you with a business plan. He wants to build a little software operation here in the Ukraine. He's already got two software designers who have a breakthrough technology for doing search on the web. And um, he's debating about leasing versus buying. He's decided he's going to buy land here and, buy a and build a factory here, and he wants to borrow some money from you. He wants a million dollars. What are you going to say? Well, uh, after a nice conversation with Bill Gates, I decided it's 10%. <laughs> so 50% for me, 10% for Bill Gates. Bill Gates will research even more. <laughs> Yes, his previous projects have got a great track record. And well, I can tell you what Bill Gates is going to say if you, are, if you charge him 10%. He's going to come over here to Yuri and say, can you do better than that? I want to borrow a million dollars. What kind of interest rate are you going to charge me? <laughs> two. I'm looking for two. Yeah, two would be good. But, you know, 
Tatanya over here really wants Bill Gates' business because what a coup to be able to say, <clears throat> we financed Bill Gates' latest project in Ukraine, right? She figures that's worth free publicity for years. So she's going to call Bill Gates and say, 1%, I'll give you the million dollars for 1%, right? So what this, is, what this shows is how risky the projects are. If I'm charged 50% and Bill Gates is charged 1%, the price of risk for him is 1%, for me it's 50%. The riskier it is, the more you should get paid to take that risk. Now, this is all very well and good for bankers. What about your mom and dads? What about you? Somebody has a great investment for you, for your retirement income. Totally safe. You can't lose money on this investment. I guarantee you, you won't lose money at all. And it pays you 50% interest a year. What's wrong with that? Yeah, everything is pretty wrong with that. But the reason everything is wrong with that is it's mispricing the risk, right? One of two things is a lie. Either it won't really pay you 50% a year. If it's really, truly safe, and that's true. It's truly, honestly, very safe. You can almost, I mean, unless the world ends, you can't lose money, then they can't pay you 50%. If they can pay you 50%, or if they, are, they say, oh, we absolutely, positively will pay 50%, that's what it pays, then it's a lie that it's totally safe. Because that is an iron law of economics, the risk-reward ratio. The greater the risk, the greater the reward you should get for taking it. So a safe investment with a really high return is a lie. It's probably a fraud, and you need to educate your readers about that. And you need to be alert when someone comes along with a great business idea they want publicity about in your magazines, in your publications. You need to ask that question. How much can people make with your investment? Oh, they can make 20, 25% a year. But it's totally safe. And you're going to say, you know, you really should go and talk to the guy down the street. We're not interested in doing a story about that, right? So the last thing you need to know about markets is that they are ruled not by facts, despite all of what I just told you, but by perception. Do you know what I mean? They're ruled not by what the truth is, but by what people think the truth is. Okay? So because everybody thinks that an iPhone is so much cooler than any other phone, iPhone char can, can charge more than it, for its phone than anybody else can. That's just perception. There's no truth to that. Now, so I know, sometimes there is truth. People say, yeah, it really is technologically better, but it can't be that much better. But perceptions are what govern markets. Um, and if you can change people's perceptions, you can affect the market. Well, what's an easy way to change someone's perception about your product? Get you guys to write about it, right? So you play a role in markets that you may not even realize you have. Every time you write a story about a product, every time you give a favorable review to a movie, every time you decide that some piece of fashion is cool and photographic and write about it, you're affecting the market because you're affecting people's perceptions. So, you're in the market whether you know it or not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
that's the last point about uh, markets. How has the internet changed markets? Now, someone will write a PhD thesis about that someday. It's a great big question, I realize, but Taurus has raised a very good point. How has the internet changed markets? Well, in one way, your, your advertisers are wrong. Uh, the internet has made it much, much, much easier to discover supply, right? You just put out a little note saying, I'm looking for uh, first edition copies of um, uh, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. You just put it out on all the websites, and everybody in the world who's got one of those can say, I got one, I got one. So it's a way to discover supply. It's a way to collect demand. If you've got one, you can say, I've got one, anybody interested? The whole world responds. So it expands both the sources of supply and the sources of demand. It also, of course, puts tools in the hands of people shaping perception. And your advertisers think that they've got all the tools they need. Um, what, what they will eventually discover as, the, as markets mature is um, if, their, if their product isn't any good, what's going to happen on their website? How many of you rely on customer reviews before you buy something? Okay. So... Do, PRP, do advertisers need the internet? Yeah. If they get bad customer reviews, it's going to hurt their, their product. So while it's true that um, an advertiser, a, a company, will have a web page, and they'll tell themselves and they'll tell you, I don't need you anymore because I can just go right over your heads and tell the public how great my product is. Okay, Jackie, I'm telling you from my website that The Wizard of Lies, my book on Bernie Madoff, is absolutely the best, most definitive account ever, and you should buy it because I'm telling you you should buy it. I'm its author. I make money if you buy it, right? But Ivan has read the book, and he didn't like it. This is not really going to be the case, I'm sure. But he didn't like it. And so he goes on Amazon and writes a review saying, don't waste your time or your money with this book. Who are you going to believe? Right. 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 And, and you're going to be able to do that because of the Internet. So the notion that you have become extraneous to the process of promoting products and promoting businesses is a wish. <laughs> it's a dream on, on the part of advertisers. You still shape demand because you're a place people can come and leave their reviews, right? You can actually review the product yourself. This is what book reviews do. You know, you know, Ivan can post a review on Amazon that Jackie might read, but you could have, you know, an expert review the book in the pages of your magazine. She might believe that even more than Ivan, right? So we still have a role as journalists to play in shaping perception. We also have a critical role to play, as I mentioned earlier, in making sure the market is honest, making sure it isn't rigged. That's our job. You know, making sure that the people who are supposed to regulate the market are doing their job. That's our job. So we're all in the market business, whether we know it or not. So now let's talk about companies. Companies are funny things. Companies, I mean, we all dream of the fountain of youth, right? Everybody, every culture has a dream of the fountain of youth that marvelous gift of living forever. Wouldn't that be marvelous? Never die. Companies got that. They're immortal. They're immortal as long as they can make money or get money or steal money. As long as they can get money, they are immortal. That's one of the neat reasons they were invented. I mean, you know, if... Um, if uh, 
is it Maria? If you're running a business and it's fabulous, everybody loves your cupcakes, they buy them, they're being, you're shipping them all over Ukraine, it is a fabulous, fabulous business and it's just going great and you're getting older, I hate to tell you, you're getting older and older and older and your daughter and son, they don't want to have anything to do with cupcakes. No, no, no. One is off skiing in the Alps and the other wants to be a, a, a guitar player. So they're not interested in taking over your business. So what are you going to do? How are you going to keep your business going after you die? Yeah, you could find somebody who'll take it over. Most likely, you're going to form a corporation. You're going to form a company because the company won't die when you do. It will carry all your secret recipes and all the equipment and leases and, it, more importantly, all those intangible relationships. I mean, you've got hotels in all parts of the country that are used to having your cupcakes for dessert. The company can hold on to those relationships. And somebody new comes in, yes, to be the new manager, for uh, Maria's cupcakes. It's not going to be Maria, but if he does a good job, then the people who own Maria's cupcakes will say, go for it, you're doing a great job. If he doesn't, the people who own Maria's cupcakes will get rid of him and bring in somebody else who does. But even when he dies, and even when all of them die, the company doesn't die. It goes on and on and on. So there's a real advantage to being immortal, right? <laughs> so companies get to be immortal. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what you call them, uh, unless they have a sunset provision in their partnership. Partnerships, limited liability companies, joint stock companies, they live forever. They just go on forever. So because they're immortal, um, they are an advantage for uh, an economy. You can all see that. Um, they also allow ownership to be divided among more than one person. I mean, Maria's owned all of Maria's cupcakes all her life. Ah, she gave the kids a few shares for their birthdays, but now she's smart. She knows they're going to go off and, and go skiing and play the guitar, so she's holding on to 99% of the stock in Maria's cupcakes. Um, but when she needs to create this immortal company to carry Maria's cupcakes out into the future, we could all wind up owning a few shares of Maria's cupcakes, right? We buy the stock when the company goes public in the IPO, and we all own a little piece of Maria's cupcakes. And if, she, if her cupcakes start moving into Romania and Poland, and my gosh, they're all the way to Paris, now you can find Maria's cupcakes in Paris. Well, is, they're making money hand over fist, and so are we. So we have become owners. But say it's not such a happy story. Maria's borrowed a lot of money to open that French uh, cupcake uh, shop. And this is Maria's Cupcakes, the company, has borrowed all of this money. And now um, it borrowed it from bondholders, and it can't pay it back. So, alas, Maria's company goes into bankruptcy. What happens to all us owners? Unfortunately, all our stock gets claimed by the bondholders, who become the new owners of Maria's Cupcakes. So if you're a stockholder... You are an owner of the company. If you're a bondholder, unless the company goes bankrupt, you are just a creditor of the company. Maria owes you money, but if, as long as she's paying her bills on time and she's paying you your interest, don't, don't drop by. She'll send you your, your cupcakes in the mail. You know, don't bother her because you're just a creditor. You're just, not, this is just like the guy she buys her flour from and the guy she buys her sugar from. You're the guy she buys her money from. And that's all it is. But if she gets in trouble, you're going to wind up owning that company. Now, stocks and bonds, they trade in marketplaces just like you've got here. And as long as you, as you say, they're regulated, they're public, they're visible, you'll get a pretty good price for shares in Maria's Cupcakes because it's a growing uh, and a valid company. Okay? Um, full disclosure of corporate financial information is not in the Ukraine what we would like it to be. That doesn't mean there isn't anything that you can learn about companies. Uh, they are required to provide some information about their financial affairs. How many great companies 
became darlings of Wall Street, darlings of London, darlings of the Ukraine stock market, because everybody was buying their stock. I don't care if everybody's buying their stock. What you need to find out as a journalist is, is anybody buying their product? Because it doesn't matter how much people are buying their stock, if they're not buying their product, that company will not survive. So, do not let yourself be fooled that a company is fabulous because its stock price has gone from a dollar to $500. That could be manipulation. That could be mania. That could be a fad. It could be everybody in the marketplace thinking, oh, God, I got to own this stock. The company won't last if you can't find anybody buying its shoes or you can't find anybody buying its software. That's how you know if a company will last, okay? Repeat after me. How management behaves matters. Why? Why does it matter? I mean, yeah, right. I mean, if you've got a CEO who is spending money like a drunken sailor, cheating on his wife, hiding money overseas, do you think he's running an honest company? Morality is of a piece. It's all one big piece of fabric. And somebody who has torn his morality apart over here in this corner of his life probably shouldn't be relied on real heavily over here in this corner of his life. So it, it's, now people get um, a little nervous about this, particularly back home. They say, oh gosh, I've got some, I've got some information about the CEO. Um, you know, he's cheating on his, on his wife. And I don't know if that's news or not. Well, my answer to that is it might be but I don't know enough yet to tell you. Every marriage has problems, right? No marriage except mine lasts forever. So it's, it's no great human failing. It is no great collapse of personal morality to learn that a guy has met someone else he loves and is going to divorce wife number one and marry wife number two. I'm not troubled by that, and I don't think that's news unless... Wife number one owns half of his company. Wow. Did it, get to, did it become news? It did. Because she's really upset about this, and she's going to fight him tooth and nail for her half of the company. And that's going to hurt the business. So, maybe it is news. Here's another scenario. It isn't just he's, he's fallen in love, is leaving wife number one, and is in love with wife number two. He's left wife number one, and he's taken 15, 16 year olds on a yacht through the Mediterranean in violation of heaven, heaven knows how many laws. Okay, that might be news, right? Because that is a moral violation on so many levels that we don't even know where to begin. So it depends on whether or not the personal peccadilloes, the personal failings, the personal immoralities of people in management are news, but it always matters. It's something you need to be aware of. Um, at Enron, famous company that blew up in 2002, it's sort of become the shorthand for fraudulent companies. Um, at Enron, the CFO, Chief Financial Officer, was allowed to set up some private partnerships that did business with Enron itself. Anybody think that's a good idea? No, not probably, because when you're signing a contract with Enron, who's signing it? The CFO. Oh, wait a minute. When he's over here doing business for the partnership, who's signing the agreement? the CFO. He's on both sides of the table. It's an incurable conflict of interest. There is no way you can be sure that's an arm's length honest deal. So why would the management at Enron let that happen? 
part, in partly it turns out because all of them were doing it and they were making a great deal of money doing it. But that's the kind of morality that it's appropriate to watch. The first job of a business reporter in covering companies is to find out how they make money. And that doesn't matter whether they're selling shoes or whether they're selling investments or whether they're selling oil and gas. Find, be sure every time you profile a corporate CEO, every time a new IPO gets written about, be sure you understand how they make money. And if they can't explain it to you, so that you can understand it. You are all intelligent, educated people. If you can't understand it, if he can't explain it to you so that you can understand it, it's probably not your fault. It probably is subterfuge, deception, half-truth, designed to cover up the fact that he doesn't know how they make money. We learned on Wall Street when all these nifty derivatives traders were creating all of these bonds backed by mortgages, backed by promises to pay mortgages, all kind of derivatives traders, the CEOs of those banks didn't know how they were making money on those things. And if you asked them questions, they couldn't answer. Uh, my friend Floyd Norris did a neat column on the gibberish that a Morgan Stanley trader in London provided, he wrote it in an email, that's how we know, provided to his boss to explain a trading strategy he was doing. This would be the trading strategy that wound up costing J.P. Uh, Morgan $9 billion. And my friend just printed what that email said. And he took it to dozens and dozens of people and said, do you understand what he's saying here? None of them, not the smartest people on Wall Street could make any sense of it at all. What did his boss at J.P. Morgan say? Sounds cool to me. Great. Go for it. So demand clarity. Make sure you understand how that company makes money. And if the CEO can't explain it to you, I would be very worried because it probably means he doesn't know how they make money either. So let's move on since we're talking about the CEO. And let's talk about the people in our world. Although companies are immortal, people aren't. They move around, they grow, they change jobs. They are your best window into markets and companies of all kinds. They are populated by people. Markets, although there are, heaven knows, computers now that run all sorts of trading. But when we think about markets at large, markets don't happen without people. Companies don't exist without people. So people are the heart of, every, of both markets and of companies. And learning to have people as your sources, people who work at companies, people who used to work at companies, people who do business with that company, people who buy their product, people who lease them their space, those are the people that need to be part of your world. Now, when you're covering people, you have to remember all the rules you already know about covering people in politics. You cover both sides, right? If I want to do a profile of a company and I ask um, the PR man at the company, I ask the CEO what he thinks of the company, and I ask the investment banker who's about to bring out the stocks what he thinks of the company. Have I covered both sides? Do I have a round of opinion about this company? That's the equivalent of covering a political candidate by talking to the candidate, his campaign manager, and his mother. That, that's what you just did for that company. You spoke to the candidate, the CEO. You spoke to the campaign manager. That would be the public relations guy. And you spoke to his mother. That would be the Wall Street banker who gave him life and gave that company birth. So you haven't covered both sides yet, have you? You need to find somebody who doesn't like that company, somebody who competes with that company and thinks they have a better product. That's how you cover both sides 
in the world of business. Now, in the, in the yes, yes, yes. And I don't usually ask them to go on the record about their competitors, but I certainly will have sources among their competitors. An even better source is their suppliers, their vendors. If you want to know whether the shoe company is doing really, really well, and they're telling you they're doing really, really, really well, you want to track down the guy who makes their boxes. Guaranteed they don't make them in-house. They contract with some paper company to make their boxes, right? If they're doing really, really well, what's going to happen to his business? Right. He's making a boatload of boxes, right? He's really happy to hear about that. So if you call and say, I hear you just, I mean, things must be booming for you, right? And he says, what? I, what do you mean? I just had to lay off 10 people last week. Well, we have a little disconnect here, don't we? Um, now, it's possible that he lost the job and another paper company got it. So you want to say, well, aren't you doing the boxes for, for um, Nautilus, uh, not, uh, Nautilus uh, shoes? And it said, yeah. Oh, dear. Probably not selling so many shoes. So you want to identify the people in this world of business. Insiders, yeah, it's hard to get them to talk. Outsiders, not so hard to get them to talk. But you need to be sure that you're getting information from both sides. And when you tell your stories, you need to be sure that you're thinking about the people who will read them. Yeah. Sure. Sure it does. And so it's part of the context in which they live. Under markets, they would be among the regulators. Under companies, they may be among the buyers. You know, they may actually invest in companies themselves. They are a player in all of these markets. But, but so are banks. So are customers and consumers. Believe me, I'm not leaving government out. It varies from nation to nation how big a role they play. After the financial crisis in 2008, we had the United States government buying banks, bailing out auto companies. It doesn't just happen in Ukraine. I mean, it, and that had, that had not happened in, oh gosh, since they built the Erie Canal back in the 1840s, it, that the government was investing in business that way. It was a crisis. It was to protect these businesses from collapsing and losing all those jobs. So government can step in as a buyer in the market. They can step in as a lender in the market. But they are a player. Unless it's a, st unless it's a state economy where there is no private ownership at all, this is pretty much the template that you've got. Now, where do you find business stories? Um, th there's treasure everywhere. There is absolutely, there, uh, one of the things that um, I find most distressing is the narrow range of topics on which most business coverage, including your own, focuses. Um, so I'm going to challenge you a little bit about the businesses you might not have thought about, just as I, I did a little earlier. Take a walk in an unfamiliar neighborhood and count the businesses. There's the food truck. There's the guy picking up the garbage. There's the dry cleaner. There's the people who supply the chemicals to the dry cleaner. Four businesses right there, and I've only passed two buildings. So you need to start looking at the world as an assortment of businesses, because that's what it is. A massage therapist, a physical trainer, um, obviously a restaurant, but who does their linens? Who puts the tablecloth on the table? That's going to be a linen supply company. When you start looking at the world as a collection of 
businesses. You begin to see how many gazillions of stories there are to write about all of those businesses. You can, you can do businesses about, you know, what are the basics? Food, clothing, shelter, right? We all got to have food, clothing, and shelter. There are stories about food, where it comes from, grocery store markets, what the margins are, what the best design for a grocery store is, where do they get their little carts, who makes those, how big a theft problem is that. So food, clothing, oh my God, where shall we start? You know, fashion, marketing, sizing, there's a million different stories about clothing. Shelter, well that's only all your residential real estate in your entire town. That's your shelter part, right? Food, clothing, and shelter, you got that, okay? What about getting around, getting served? Retail businesses, restaurants, hotels, taxis, buses, uh, uh, charter buses, charter services, charter airlines, getting around, getting, getting served, getting the basics of life, they're all stories. Um, now, while we still have enough time to, to review them, there are, I think, before you, little packages of newspaper stories, right? Okay. I want you to take a minute, and you can work together if you like. I, oh, did you not? Um, okay, you should have a package of four stories. Everybody have four different ones? Okay, and can you share? You don't need to write on them, so you, so you can share them if you, if you don't mind. Okay, now, we've talked about markets, companies, and people. I want you to take a minute, look at those stories. And tell me which category you think that story fits in. What category or combination of categories resulted in that story? For example, if I've got, um, I thought I had a story from, here we go. Here we go. Um, Let's look at the euro boosted by Spain data, right? Just as an example. Is this about a market? It's a currency market story, right. Um, hmm, do we see any people in here? Hmm? It affects people, it sure does, but you didn't read about any of them in here, did you? Hmm? Yeah, I did. But are they in this story? No, right? Whoever wrote this little bitty story, and with all sympathy, it's from the Financial Times, and that is their bailiwick, Financial Times, right? But whoever wrote this story wrote only the market aspect. A paragraph in there that would say, this is going to be a big boom to Spanish manufacturers, company XYZ is going to be able to sell a lot more stuff, that would have brought in this element. And maybe there would have been, you know, tourism, you know, the, the small mom and pop businesses that reply, rely on tourism are going to be affected by this. Even in a little bitty story like this, it could have been strengthened if you added these two other elements. Now take the other three, now that you see what we're doing here. Take the other three and tell me which of these you think dominates and whether or not you think they left something out that should have been there, okay? Let's all first look at the Tribune story. Tribune story, so we can all discuss that together. Raise your hand when you're finished reading it so we all know we're ready. Meanwhile, I will go.
by the way, I'll make these PowerPoint slides avail available to you. They're sort of an outline of what I've been talking about. Everybody done with the Tribune or working your way through the Tribune story? Okay. Which category does this dominate? Is this dominant? Company. company. It is a company story. Now, okay, tell me what the market element was. The, the publishing industry. So it's an industry story, but is it a market story? It's an industry story, right? It's about an industry. Does it tell me anything about people impact in here? Would it be stronger if it did? Is there something I need to know about the people affected by this story? Maybe, maybe not. This company has gone through bankruptcy, as you'll know here. It laid off an enormous number of employees. Does this tell us whether they're going to hire anybody as a result of this deal? Are going to make any jobs as a result of this deal? No. no. And it would have been a much stronger, better story if it did, wouldn't it? If it did tell us what, how people would be affected. So this could have been a companies plus people story, and I would have loved it. I would have said, oh, my gosh, there were all these people who laid, laid off in Chicago. Now some of them are going to be going to work there. Or, oh, gosh, it isn't going to help the job situation at all. It's not going to make any jobs for people, right? Just as... The Euro story, the Spain Euro story, could have been a markets people story, markets company story, or a combination of the two, right? That could have happened too. Now, let's look at the Apple story. Is this a market story? A company story or a people story? This is a story about Apple offices and retails raided in the French market. We done? Okay. Now, the headline would make you think this is what? Company story, right? Is it really? It's a market story. You're absolutely right. Yes. It, are the players in this market, including the government player, right? The, the government of France. So this is a market story that looks like a company story. It's really about marketing. Now... There's something about the company in there. It actually comes a little closer to this, although that's much stronger. There's something about the company in here and its products. Any people in here? No. No people at all. I'm not sure how you would put people in this story. It would be an interesting challenge to think about. You guys can think about that in your spare time. Um, but it would certainly be a stronger story if it had some people in there. And I don't mean just people commenting, you know. I'm not talking about just having sources in here. There is actually one of those. What I mean is the impact on people or people working there, the, the people uh, who are affected by this story. Now, finally, read the latest onus on low-wage workers. It's 
a little longer. It's going to take a little more time. I'm going to get a little more water. Thanks. Okay? Where does this one fit? And companies, I think I saw a few banks and businesses. In fact, there's one that is actually the focus of this story. What's its name? Um, NetSpend. NetSpend of Austin, Texas is, is the company. I love this story, by the way. Um, I was outraged by this story because the notion that you would charge hardworking, low-wage people, charge them for their own paycheck, seems to me utterly, it's Alice in Wonderland. It's just crazy that, that people have to pay some bank or some company to get the money they have worked all month to earn. Does that sound right to you? Didn't sound right to me. So there's a, there's a very profound issue of social equity that's never explicitly stated here, but that certainly comes to your mind when you read it. But it's about markets, the labor market, right? It's about companies the banks and the other little companies that are making a fortune off this little thing, and the companies who are their customers, who have found this nifty way to save money, save them money, by the way. Somebody says they saved, what, $27,000 by not actually handing a worker a paycheck? You think they divided that up with the worker? No. The, so they saved money, but the workers are spending money to get their paycheck. So it's about companies. And it's also about people, the people who are affected by this story. And you can really get into their lives and see how cumbersome it would be. The telling issue of this woman who figured out that the way she could spend the least money to get her own paycheck, that is, the, the way she could spend the least to get all the money she earned was to take it all out at one time and stick it in a box and put it in her closet. You know, my granddad used to do that with his money because he couldn't afford a bank. I mean, when you think about how primitive that is, it really pulls you up short. So I offer this as an example of, of how combining all three of these elements, markets, companies, and people, can add so much more power to your business stories, right? It's just, it's just amazing how much more interesting. Which one did you most enjoy reading? I know which one I most enjoyed. Which, yeah, by a, how many thought this was not the best written, the most interesting piece in the, yeah, no hands. Go. So the, th this is reader-friendly. It it, it, it grabs your emotions. I, I find myself caring a lot more about this than about the fact that the Tribune just bought a new television station. Now, maybe you could have made me care about that. Maybe you could have made me care about Tribune buying a new television station. If you put some people in there, if you told me how it was going to affect the neighborhood, how it was going to change news coverage in Chicago, you might have made me care about it, but that story that we read didn't. Okay, let me see. There's one thing else I need to do. Most of what you do is event-driven, right? You're, you're covering breaking news, many of you. 
Uh, it's event-driven journalism. You don't get a choice about what you're going to write about today. You're going to write about what happened today, right? Just want to uh, list a few little questions to keep in your mind. Put it on your desk. If you do a lot of news-driven, event-driven journalism, something happens, you run out and cover it, and then you come back. And the next day, something else happens, you run out and cover it, and then you come back. And they're, they're obvious, and I know Jackie covered them in a different way when she's talking about building sources and, and uh, uh, looking at the source wheel for, for stories. But obviously, if, if it's breaking news, you've got to cover it uh, when it happens. But you want to try to get a little bit out in front. You should always ask, is this an isolated event? Is this something that's happening just in the life of this company, just in this particular person's personal history? Is it an isolated event, or is it bigger? And if it's bigger, that's your second story. That's your second day story, another story you can write. You also want to ask, um, does it affect people beyond this company? Find out who they are and include them in your story. Is this something that all businesses are or will be experiencing? And if so, we call those trend stories. You want to find out what that trend is. Company stories can lead you to all of those things. Now, it's your turn uh, to ask me questions. And um, anything that I didn't cover about the essentials of financial reporting. As I said, you're going to get chapter and verse about how to tell if a company is making money, how to tell if it's not, how to tell how much it's earning, it's paying its management. You're going to learn more about that later this summer, and you're going to love it. Guaranteed, it's going to be fun. But any other questions that we didn't cover today about the basic business journalism that you do? Yeah. Ethical issues. Yeah. We got a whole class on that tomorrow, which you're going to love, but that's okay. Uh, because, for example, in the case that you have uh, the problems with the income, yep. the employees are going to be affected by that. Yep. Familiar with it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not just in the Ukraine, by the way, it's a worldwide problem. Hmm? Uh, not Jinza. They, in, other, uh, in Africa, they call it brown envelope journalism. Yeah. In China, they call it brown en envelope journalism. Red envelope journalism in China. Um, it would get you fired in the United States. To accept money from the person you're writing a story about would get me fired. Our ethics codes specifically refuse it. It is not, I understand that it is a big problem in developing journalism organizations, and unfortunately, it's a particularly hard problem to tackle. We're going to spend a lot of time on this tomorrow. It's a hard problem to tackle because it's, it's got to be fought one by one by one by one. Each of you have to decide where you stand on that issue because if you don't act together, if you don't collectively act together, you cannot change it. Now, one of the things that helped move in this direction in the United States was back in the 1970s, an organization was formed called the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, S-A-B-E-W. It wrote the first ethics code for American business journalists. And they can't kick you out of the business if you don't follow it, but it became a badge of honor for journalists to say, I subscribe to the Cebu uh, Code of Ethics. Collectively, you can try to move in that direction. Now, I know what you're going to say. What if the owner of your corporation thinks that's the way to have it done? I mean, in some places in Africa, the guy who gets the, the brown envelope goes back to the newsroom and shares part of it with his editor or with his publisher, right? So I know it's a, it's a problem, I and mean, we certainly will wrestle more with that, uh, with that tomorrow. Um, but um, it's incompatible with ethical journalism. It's, the two cannot exist in the same world. It is incompatible with ethical journalism. 
Sure we do, and nobody emerged from those scandals with their reputation for ethics improved. It does happen occasionally that someone is found to have taken money. For example, a columnist at the Wall Street Journal. He was writing a column that could make markets move. He could write about a stock, and the day it, that column runs, that stock would go up. Well, it might be helpful to know what he was writing about in advance, wouldn't it? Yeah, so you know, you learn on Tuesday morning that his Wednesday column is going to be about Volt Company. Great, you go out and buy some cheap shares, or maybe you'll just buy options on Volt because that's even cheaper, but you buy some cheap shares of Volt, of Volt, you wait for his column to run, and then you sell him because it, it's going to go up and you're going to make a nice little profit. He went to prison. He got caught doing that, and he went to prison. So yes, it happens. And even if everybody bands together and says, we, we don't think that's the ethical way to run journalism, it will happen here. What, what matters is what you do when it does happen. When it does happen, what do you do? Um, there was a young man who worked in my paper, Jason Blair who was plagiarizing from other reporters in other parts of the country. He was lying, fabricating stories, pretending he had gone off to a place to report on a funeral when he never left the building. Um, he got caught. He got part, caught plagiarizing, and that's when they learned about all these other sins that he had been committed. He was fired. He still has not gotten a journalism job anywhere in the country. So... Um, there are consequences. What, I can't guarantee you that we've stamped out all of our moral problems, but I can tell you that there are consequences. I'll also tell you I'm a little concerned, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, I'm a little concerned that younger journalists coming up through the Internet route are, are less concerned about these ethical issues than journalists my age are, but we'll discuss that tomorrow. Getting back to the basics of your business journalism and financial writing questions, ideas that you'd like to share, things that you've done that other people here might benefit from. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Well, that's a, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because that is a fundamental problem. Covering business doesn't mean being a cheerleader for business, but unfortunately, that's how it sometimes turns out. That's certainly what happened in part to people covering the stock market prior to 2008. There were, particularly in the television news, there were companies, there were shows whose entire audience were investors. <coughs> well, if you go out um, with those, th that audience and say, you know, this market is really getting frothy. It's starting to look like a bubble to me. Anybody who's still in this market is crazy. Sell all your stock and put it under the mattress until we get out of this bubble. What's going to happen to that show? It's going to lose all its advertisers. It's going to lose all its viewers because its viewers want to play the market. So they're responding to their, their uh, viewers. Um, and they became cheerleaders for, oh, this is great. The stock, look how much the stock is up. Don't ask me why we're happier on days when the stock market is up than we are when it's not. My husband is. He said, oh, the market's up 50 points. And I say, why do we care? You know, it, we, it, I'm not one bit happier because the market went up today. But it's easy when you're t when, particularly um, when it feels like this three-legged stool is, is weaker in one of those legs, you know, that, that business is having a hard time. It's, it's easy to sort of try to, you know, uh, be protective of it. 
A far better strategy is to try to be explanatory about it. You know, instead of saying business is having a hard time, so we need to defend business, you need to explain and understand why business is having a hard time. If they're having a hard time because they're making shoddy products, then you cheering for them isn't going to help. What they need to do is make better products. If they're having a hard time because of specific government policies, and you can identify that and make the connection, then ex exposing that, explaining that, is that taking a side? No. You're, expe you're expanding what people know about how business works. Um, but I can't say that it isn't tempting to see, to, when you're a business reporter, to be biased in favor of business. Um, it's something you have to constantly work at, at correcting, at staying balanced. Yep, one more question, yeah. Some international business news uh, do not have direct link to Ukraine. For example, if Spain sells bonds on 4 billion euros, uh, 9 out of 10 Ukrainian editions won't buy the bonds because uh, there is no direct right. and interesting link. So how do you think, uh, how close should the focus of the Ukrainian business edition on the international business news? What's interesting and what's not? Well, the secret to survival in our business is making yourself indispensable. Giving indispensable means I got to have you. I, air is indispensable. Oxygen is indispensable. Food is indispensable. I die if I don't get it. I, my life is not as good if I don't get it. Making yourself indispensable, a necessary, essential tool a necessary and essential element of your reader's life is how you survive. Now, many of your readers are going to have a lot of sources for international news, international business news. If it's not news that interests them, they won't read it. They don't really need a Ukrainian publication to tell them about international news that has no impact in Ukraine. But nobody but you can tell them about business in Ukraine. I can't read The Economist except every, you know, what, eight months they might have a story about Ukraine, right? I can't rely on The Economist for my Ukraine news. I can't rely on The New York Times for my, my Ukraine. Only you guys can do that. So in a world of limited resources, I would put my resources into the thing that only I can do that readers have to get from me and can't get from anybody else. And that covers business news as well. You had a question, too. Uh, I was concerned about the uh, for example, in Ukraine. I don't read the big, uh, that uh, information. But, for example, yesterday, the Portugal sells bonds with the high uh, interest rate. Mm -hmm. And what's the impact of the year of the yes, what the, the past uh, situation that impacted this uh, result was the, the death Portugal sold bonds with the highest interest rate for But so what for Ukraine? For Ukraine so Were you selling bonds the same day in the market? If, if you want to write a story about how a bond deal in Portugal affects Ukraine, God bless you. Great. No, I'm not be, I'm not be, great. If you can show your readers in Ukraine how a bond deal in Portugal matters to them because it, me, it meant that the euro moved and their, and your currency, Gribnia, moved and as a result, your products are more or less competitive when you try to sell them an export, 
or it's going to be more or less expensive for your manufacturers to buy raw material from abroad. If you make those connections, nobody else is making that connection. I guarantee you it wasn't in the FT story about that Portuguese bond deal, what impact it would have in Ukraine. That's perfectly legitimate. If you can take an international business development and show your readers why it matters here to them in Ukraine, heavens, yes, you do those stories. No one else is doing that. But if there is no local impact, or if you haven't taken the time and the effort to find it, then... Yes. And to explain to them how it, in, how. Well, maybe, maybe, you know, an earthquake in Western China might not. I mean, I can think of a number of things that might not affect Ukraine. However, um, if you can find a connection, then explain it to your reader, and then you're home free. If you can't and you don't, um, they're not going to read it. And you will have wasted space and resources on something that, that wasn't meaningful to them. You've got to give them a reason to read you. And frankly, talking about the business life they live, writing about the, the companies, the shops, the, bit, the, the workers, the, uh, the products, the movies, the books, the, 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 uh, uh, the kitchen equipment, the, the exotic foods, the olive oil, that's part of people's everyday lives. And if you cover that more aggressively and more creatively, your readers are going to love it.